So if you don't want to appear on the recording, basically just don't say anything and don't show up. Um, so welcome to the first session in 2021 of the IES virtual EPR meeting. I'm quite excited about this. Uh, we have two speakers today. And the first one is uh, Dinar Abdulin. Uh, he did his bachelor and master's in physics in Kazan Federal University in Russia. Then he did a PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Bonn with Olaf Schiemann. And at the same place, he also did a postdoc and now he's an academic staff. Uh, and today he's going to talk about RITME spectroscopy on iron-3 binding proteins. Uh, Dinar. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. As follows from the topic, my talk will be a focus on iron binding proteins. So an iron ion is a common cofactor in many proteins and uh, about, according to protein data bank, almost 50% uh, of all salt structures that contain transition metal ions correspond to iron binding proteins. More importantly, iron binding proteins are involved in many essential processes. For example, myoglobin and hemoglobin allow to store and transport oxygen. A large family of cytochromes P450 allow the catalysis and also the molecular iron can be stored in our bodies by means of, of the pro proteins like transferrin and ferritin. And in order to understand the function of these proteins at the molecular level, methods are required to study the structure of these proteins. And one of such methods is path bipolar EPR spectroscopy or shortly PDS. PDS allows to measure the distances between two or more electron spin centers within a biomolecule by measuring the dipolar coupling between the spin centers. And as you can see from the equation, um, the dipolar coupling is inverse proportional to the third power of the distance. So there is a correlation between these two. In order to be able to apply PDS to iron binding proteins, we need to, uh, to have at least two electrons inside over them. Typically this problem is, uh, this goal is achieved by spin labeling the protein. And for that, we usually remove all, cis all native cysteines from the protein surface and then introduce two cysteines into the desired positions. And then uh, we can use the spin label like methyl sulfonate spin label to react specifically to lift the cysteine and to form for example, the nitroxide containing R1 side chain. Alternatively, we can replace one of the spin labels by an intrinsic iron uh, center. And this possibility comes from the fact that one of two typical oxidation states of iron, namely iron free plus, is paramagnetic and can be found either in the low spin state, the spin number one half, or in the high spin state of spin number five half. And using the intrinsic uh, iron ion for this measurement has several advantages over the same measurement between two spin labels. One of the advantages is that number of mutations of the wild type protein can be reduced in the given case from two to one. Uh, another advantage is that uh, the intrinsic iron ion binds usually quite tightly to the protein and therefore the distances measured between this ion and the spin label are in a way more exact than the distances between two flexible spin labels. Uh, also this measurement allows some additional applications such as uh, localization of iron within the protein or um, rigid body docking of different protein domains through the intrinsic metal ions. Uh, beside, uh, despite these advantages, um, the measurements on the, um, between the iron ions and spin labels is way more difficult than the measurements between two nitroxide spin labels. And the reason for that is the fact that both low, sp 
spin and high spin iron ions have very broad EPR spectrum. So this broad EPR spectrum make most of BDS pulse techniques very inefficient. So the question what, which we addressed in our study was, can we do distance measurements between intrinsic iron ions and nitroxide spin labels in an in a efficient way? And our idea was to use uh, relaxation-induced dipolar modulation enhancement pulse sequence, also known as readme. And in the readme, all five pulse sequences are um, all five pulses, sorry, are applied at the nitroxide spin to generate a, a signal which is uh, called a rever a re refocused virtual echo. At the same time, the iron spin is flipped in the interval demix of this pulse sequence, thus modulating the amplitude of refocused virtual echo. And when we do it in a time resolved manner, then we get this time trace. And next, of course, um, we need to translate this time trace into the distance distribution. And for the spin centers with the quantum number S1 half, an isotropic G factor, there are a number of programs that can do that. For example, DR analysis, DRNN, DD, and so on. However, neither low spin iron nor high spin iron are isotropic spin centers. And also, obviously, for high spin iron, we do not have a spin one half system. So the additional question which arises: how can we transform the time trace into the distance distribution for these two metal centers. So let me begin with the considering high spin iron. And here is a typical spin Hamiltonian given. It contains three terms, the axial zero field splitting term, the rhombic zero field splitting term, and the Zeeman term. For most of the relevant uh, iron a free plus um, ions in biomolecules, the zero field splitting constant D, axial one, is large and positive, whereas the rhombic uh, zero field splitting constant is very small, so we can approximately say that it's zero. And in this case, the energy levels of the high spin iron split into three doublets described by quantum numbers plus minus one half, plus minus three half, and plus minus five half. And importantly, they are separated by the energy of 2D and 4D. So if we perform our experiments at a sufficiently low temperatures, meaning that the, at the temperatures at which the thermal energy is smaller than the uh, energy between the lowest two doublets, then we populate only the lowest doublets of the high spin iron, and thus this iron can be considered as an effective spin one half system with quite an isotropic G factor. And for the relevant case, the, when E equals zero, two out of uh, three G values equal six, and one G value of high spin iron equal two. So now we are at the situation when we can consider both the low spin and the high spin iron ions as spin one half systems, and both of them have an isotropic G factor. Next, we use the theory of Bedillo and Marbiasa for dipole, uh, dipole interaction between anisotropic spin pairs, spin systems, and derive the following equation for the dipole coupling frequency between an iron ion and a nitroxide spin label. And from the first look, it looks very much similar to the isotropic case. That's the only difference that now the dipolar coupling frequency is scaled by effective G value of the height in, uh, of the iron ion. And also the angular part of the equation contains this very complicated product, which says nothing but uh, that it depends on the relative orientation of the distance vector connecting to spins and the G axis of the iron ion. And the later dependence can, or the later, yeah, the later orientation can be described by two angles. The um, 
angle xi, the polar angle xi, and azimuthal angle phi. So now we have our theoretical prediction and we can do some simulations. First, we simulated the spectrum of the nitroxide nitroxide spin pair. And since both of the spin centers are almost isotropic, then we get the typical peg doublet for the dipolar spectrum. However, then one of the nitroxide is replaced by a high spin iron with the axial G tensor. We get quite significantly different spectra. Importantly, they can be up to three times broader than the usual peg pattern. And also they have either three or one singularity depending on the value of this angle C. Whereas the peg doublet has only two singularities. The things get even more complicated when we consider the case of the low spin iron, which usually as orthorhombic G fat. In this case, the dipolar um, uh, spectrum depends not only on the angle C, but also on the angle phi. And for all these angles, the dipolar spectra deviate significantly from the peg level. What does it tell us? It tells us if we want to extract accurate distance information out of the data, uh, which we acquired on the, high, on the iron nitroxide spin pair, we need to use another theory. And that motivated us to develop a new program, which we called anisodipfit, which basically uses uh, the theory which I presented in the previous slide. And if we consider this program as a black box, then it gets in the input uh, a readme time trace or a readme spectrum, as well as the G factors of both spin centers. And in the output, we get the distance distribution for the distributions of both angles, as well as the confidence intervals. Of course, getting three distributions out of, out of a single readme time trace is a difficult and ill posed problem. So in order to achieve uh, this goal, we have to take some simplifying assumptions. And uh, the assumptions which we used were that all three distributions can be approximated by a uniform distribution or a, a normal distribution. And in both cases, we need just two parameters per distribution, a mean value and a width. And also the correlation between distance and both angles are usually not known beforehand and therefore neglected in the problem. So, so far we prepared the theoretical basis for the readme based distance measurement between intrinsic iron ions and nitroxides. Then we went, of course, for the corresponding experiments on few model systems. And for the high spin iron nitroxide spin pair, we prepared two model systems. One which is based on iron TPP complex linked with the nitroxide. And the second test system was met myoglobin, uh, which was mutated at site Q8 and then spin labeled with MTSA. The nice thing about this model systems that they can be easily converted into the low spin iron nitroxide model system just by giving a large excess of either immediate soil or azide. So in the end, we end up with four test systems. Next, of course, we did the five pass readme experiments on them. All experiments were done at Q band. It turned out that the temperature of three Kelvin was the optimal for the high spin iron, whereas 12 Kelvin was optimal for the low spin iron. And after a few hours of uh, measurement, we could already get a quite good signal to noise ratio. And after the background correction, which is shown by a red dashed line here, you can see that we get the time traces the the modulation depth of 30 to 40%, which is fairly good modulation depth. 
Next, we applied the Fourier transformation to our time traces in order to obtain the dipolar spectra. And as you can see, although the distance distributions in both model compounds and both met myoglobin samples are expected to be similar, the width of the corresponding dipolar spectrum is really different. So for example, for the compound one, the spectrum spans range up to 20 megahertz, whereas for one with imidazole only up to 10. So that shows that all our spectra are scaled by the G values of the corresponding iron ions. Moreover, none of the uh, spectra uh, resemble the shape of the pig gun. So especially for the high spin iron compound, uh, you can see that there are three distinct peaks, three distinct singularities, uh, which is in line with our theory. Then in order to get distances and angle distributions out of this data, we applied um, an isodipfit program. And uh, in the case of high spin model compounds, we uh, fitted the spectra with an isodipfit program, uh, whereas in the case of low spin iron nitroxide model compounds, we fitted the time traces. So the results of an isodipfit analysis for the high spin model compounds are shown on this slide. As you can see, reasonably good fits were obtained uh, to the experimental data um, using the parameters listed in a table. And in order to get an idea of what are, what are the confidence intervals of these parameters, we recorded additional dependencies of goodness of fit chi-square uh, on different pairs of parameters. For example, dependence of chi-squared on the mean distance and its uh, standard deviation, or the mean C-angle and its standard deviation. And the optimized solutions are shown in these pictures by a white dot, and dark red regions correspond to pre-sigma confidence intervals. The pre-sigma confidence intervals are also given in the tables. As you can see, all parameters of distance distribution can be obtained to very good precision, so um, better than one angstrom. And also the angular parameters are very well defined with an average precision of one degree. Next, we also wanted to check that uh, the parameters which we determined make sense, and therefore we did additional MD simulations on both, for both model systems. And basically, if one compares these parameters, if um, the readme results, one can see that they uh, show an overall agreement. Then the same analysis was also done for the low spin uh, compounds. And here again, the good, time tra uh, good fits to the experimental time traces were obtained for the, for the parameters given in the table. And as compared to the case of axial high spin iron, here we have also the angle phi resolved because of the orthorhom G factor of flow spin iron. Then the confidence intervals were determined of all fitting parameters were determined in a way they were done, that in a way it was done for high spin iron compounds. And the conclusion here is that the, uh, the distance distributions can be still determined quite well uh, with the precision, which is better than one angstrom, whereas the angular parameters have mean error of plus minus 30 degree. And this quite large uncertainty of the angular parameters uh, can be under, very, very well understood if one takes into account that the G anisotropy of the low spin iron is much smaller than, uh, than the G anisotropy of the high spin iron. Again, we also did some MD simulation, and basically the result is that MD simulation are more or less in agreement with the readme results. So we can confirm that we can reliably determine not only the distance parameters, but also the angles. To make a short conclusion, uh, the ready-to-use procedure was established for the readme-based distance measurements 
between iron, ions, and organic spin labels and proteins. And the program Anisodipfit was developed for extraction of distance and angular distributions from raw PDS data acquired on spin pairs with one isotropic and one anisotropic spin centers. Recall that all readme experiments which were done on all four um, model system implied that we acquired the signal on the nitric side. And quite recently, there was a publication from the group of Gunayeshka where they tried to measure the readme background on different nitric sites, and they found out that the background is not uh, gradually decaying, but rather it has some strange feature which they called an artifact. And since this is somehow related to our topic as well, we, um, I forgot one thing, they also found out quite surprisingly that the, the position of this artifact depends on the interpulse interval tau one. So we try to reproduce this result using NHS nitroxide. Again, we wear it the tau one value. And indeed, we see that it is the background is not uh, smoothly decaying, um, but it has two maxima, not just one, by two at certain positions. And this uh, maxima, which we call artifact, disappear as soon as tau one gets larger than tau two. In order to have an idea what can be the origin of this artifact, we look at the readme sequence one again and realize that if at the condition then t equal tau one, we have a subsequence within the readme sequence which looks very much like a car parcel sequence when we have the first interpulse interval tau one, then two tau one, and again tau one. So we think that the origin of the first artifact in the readme background is dynamic decoupling. And that also would explain why the amplitude of the background goes up at, uh, at t equal tau one. In order to suppress this artifact, we develop a new pulse sequence, a six pulse sequence. And the only difference of this pulse sequence to the five pulse sequence is that the primary echo, in this case, refocused echo, is generated by Carl Parfel sequence instead of just a usual Han pulse sequence. And putting the Carl Parfel sequence in front ensures that we have dynamic decoupling not only for a particular value of t, namely t equal tau one, but for all possible values of t. And in this case, as you can see, if we measure then six pulse readme on this nitroxide, then the first artifact is significantly suppressed. The second artifact at t equal tau two minus tau one is still there. And additionally, we see and for the six pulse readme, one more artifact at t equal tau two minus two tau one. The reason of the later two artifacts is still unclear. The only what we can say, they both seem to appear when the uh, transverse evolution time of, uh, of the magnetization before the mixing block and after the mixing block is equal. However, since both of the later two artifacts appear just in the end of the readme time trace, we can easily get rid of them by cutting our time axis at slightly shorter t values. So we can avoid both of them. At this point, I would like to stop and thank the people who work with me on the project. Of course, it is the group of Olaf Schiemann. I would like to thank also Gregor Heiglöken for the biochemistry. Uh, Arne Lutzen and Christoph Klein synthesized the model compounds I showed. Stefan Grimm and Sebastian Spiecher did the MD simulations. And I would also like to thank Hideto Matsuoka, Maxim Yulikov, and Alexander Mariasov for a very interesting discussion of um, the theory of dipole, dipole interaction. And I would like to thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much. Um, as usual, uh, there we have some time for questions. Um, so please digitally raise your hand uh, if you have any. Um, I think under the participants panel, you could do this. Um, there are no questions yet. I mean, maybe I ask something first so people could think a little bit. Um, so you said that you uh, basically didn't have any correlation between the uh, distances and the angles, right? Or you said that there are none. We assume that there is no, but obviously there can be some correlation. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's um, it's hard to predict it. Yeah, okay, because basically in, in this first model compound, I would actually expect that there's some correlation depending, on, because it's kind of a straight line and then the label, right? So, uh, but... For sure, but we cannot prove it. Okay. Uh, then uh, Thomas and not Otto, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Hey, good talk. Very fascinating. Uh, quick question about, so now you did all the stuff on myoglobin, which is uh, the small brother of hemoglobin. Now I suspect you probably want to look into hemoglobin as well. Uh, the question what uh, arises to me is, now let's say you have one nitroxide and now you have two iron centers. Um, assuming they are a similar distance away, could you resolve both angles, both uh, popul angle population to differentiate the two distance populations? You mean two iron centers and one nitroxide or two What's iron? Uh, two, two iron center, one nitroxide. But, uh, because then you would have two distance population P of R, but you also would have two, uh, which are around maybe the same, maybe not very different, but the, this, the angle population would be severely different because the angle would be different. Now, I suspect one could be able to rather straightforward uh, separate them and differentiate the distances and such assign them. Yes, that, that should be possible. But at the current stage, the, our, the program anisotipid does not allow to account for the superposition of two distributions. Mm -hmm. So that would one would need to uh, extend the analysis program okay. uh, for uh, this case. But in, in theoretically, that should be possible. Right, right. Uh, one more question since I'm on it, sorry. Uh, for the last, uh, where you showed the artifact for the background correction, there was an offset for the intensities. Like, uh, f so I'm just wondering, why is that offset for the intensity? Init like initially, the black one has the offset of around 0 0.05 uh, echo intensity from the black, the gray and the black, they have offset of 0 0.05. Actually, actually, they both start from one. It's right. just in the five pass readme, you get a decay of the signal, short decay, and then it raises up. Okay, okay. And then it goes back. So that's so it's of, just a, so it's just a normalization issue. Yeah, yeah, they are both normalized to one and okay. to the time point zero. So okay. the way it's shown is right. The overall intensity for the six poles and five poles, let's say at a one point five microsecond, is around the same. Is that correct then? At 0 0.5. Uh, at 1.5 microsecond, let's say I compare one of them. If I let the overall, the absolute echo intensity uh, for same number of scans and all that stuff, how much does it? Oh, that would be difficult to say. I would need to take a look. I might expect that the, that the intensity of echo for the six pulse readme would be slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. because that's not, we have a long evolution not, time right but that's just in a, uh, because of the addition of the pools has nothing to do with the artifact really uh, yeah that has nothing to do importantly uh, both uh, five pulse and six pulse readme backgrounds shown here were recorded with the same uh, acquisition time mm. so meaning that you can see from by eye that signal to noise ratio is uh, comparable Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then there was a question in the chat. I just quickly read it from Andre Marco. Is it possible to do a usual Peldor experiment on the present presented iron 3 nitroxide system? Can the results be compared in terms of precision of extracted angles and distances? Yeah, it is possible. Moreover, it was done. Uh, not only by our group, but also by um, um, 
Graham Smith and, Sab and um, Sabine von Dorsler. And they did, uh, they have actually a couple of studies. And in the original study, when they applied Heldor to low spin iron, the signal to noise ratio was uh, not very good. But then they used com composite pulses and the signal to noise ratio was much better. But as soon as you either flip or detect iron spins with your selective microwave pulses, you cannot exclude situation that you have orientational selectivity. And the advantage of the rhythmic signals that uh, iron spin is flipped here by uh, non-selective relaxation event. So we, we shouldn't make doubts in about orientational selectivity. Uh, for the high spin iron, I think our study remains to be the only one which was done uh, in, term, in concerning PDS measurements. Thanks. Uh, then uh, Ilya. Thanks for the lovely talk, Dinari. ZFS systems are really hard. They always are. I have a technical question. From the data processing point of view, the only kernel we can handle really well uh, in the pulse dipolar spectroscopy is, of course, the, the spin half dipolar kernel. So my question is, can you think of, or might there be, some kind of pre-processing or post-processing of this data, which then reduces the data processing to the problem of inverting the spin half dipolar kernels that we know how to invert? Okay. So the direct answer, the direct answer to the, your question does not come to my mind. One would really need to look into mathematics. Mm -hmm. What kind of tricks can we do or in there? Some kind of variable substitution, some kind of integral transform to get it into yes, the shape but, um, and then translate it back. Yeah, the problem is that this kernel depends on angle as well on angles and distances at the same time, and somehow somehow simplifying it and uh, might be possible. I would not exclude, but I'm not aware of the possibility to do that so far. Thanks. Okay, then one last question. Uh, from Angeliki, uh, in the peg pattern of the model compound, there were a couple of peaks that could not be fitted. Any idea where they come from? Mm -hmm. That's an experimentalist point of view. Um, <laughs> Angeliki, uh, the, these peaks which were not fitted, I hope that you mean this one. Yes, um, yes, I refer to this yeah. one. Yeah, so that's uh, unfortunately a remaining ism which survived the ISM uh, averaging procedure. So we do the ISM averaging procedure as we typically do in PELDO by averaging uh, tau one and tau two intervals over certain values. And for some reasons, which I don't know really, for the model compound one, the, this uh, averaging did not work as good as uh, we would expect. Therefore, we see some deuterium peaks over there, but they are not severe. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, then uh, thank you very much again. Uh